So a warm welcome, please, for Suki Gill. Thank you. So, good morning. Um, my talk today is going to be in three parts. Uh, the first part will pick up where uh, the Deloitte team left off in terms of digital transformation. So I'll cover a little bit of how we're, as DXC technology, talking to our clients about digital transformation and how we're advising them to navigate that journey to business agility and where they should get started and, and how to work out where to get started. Uh, the middle section is going to talk through a little bit of three examples of what we're using as enterprise architecture artifacts to define what my team do in the field. So I lead senior technologists. These are typically uh, enterprise architects in the open group sense of CA certification, uh, master level and above. So these are architects who are placed on customer accounts uh, where they're facing off against uh, both IT and business leaders as they are transforming um, the enterprise to deal with digital disruption. And uh, I'm going to talk through a few examples there of what that team is bringing back to the center because overall, my role is charged with driving new revenue from new and emerging technology as it relates to what the customers want to buy, not necessarily what we currently have as a portfolio. And then the last part, I'm actually going to talk through some sort of practical examples of what that means in terms of a culture change, because there's quite a significant change from what we've been used to as enterprise architects engaging on large-scale transformations to the level of agility and speed that is required and demanded by business now as they engage on digital transformation. And that's actually where I'm going to start. So in 2015, I did seven months in a spin-out for HP. So HP was um, uh, the company I worked for before uh, we merged together with CSC to form DXC Technology. And so in HP, I did a spin-out in 2015. It was a small startup, 42 people in the organization, based out of Silicon Valley, Sunnyvale, California, and Westwood, Massachusetts, and we were working on a competitor to Slack. Um, so Slack, if you don't know, is a, a Teams-type uh, product that is used uh, for collaboration, team collaboration. And uh, interestingly, as I joined as the CTO, my job was to go to pitch to venture capitalists to get additional funding as the CTO. Uh, I was also the uh, VP of engineering. So as I arrived, I tried to understand the architecture behind the product we were building. And as I went to see the product owner and the senior developers, they actually said to me, um, we don't actually have any documentation. You will have to read the code to find out what we're building as a product, which I was just flabbergasted by, right? Because I'm used to the at least the big picture diagram. Now, in the tool set we were using, which was Atlassian, a uh, product um, called Jira for managing tasks and issues, there's also a wiki part called Confluence. And in the Confluence website, so think about this as a, like a Wikipedia page, I did actually find a diagram. And it was by Frog Design. So Frog Design was the agency that was originally used to design the product. And it was a business model canvas by any name. It didn't look like a BMC that I recognized, but it actually covered all the attributes. So th the short story to that is that the architecture artifacts had got lost between the original design of the product and what the developers were building. There was no longer an association strictly between what was originally designed as the problem that was being solved and what the product was actually being built. It took me some time to recover that. Um, now, scale forward to about a month ago, 27th of March, and I was in Manila at the Association of Enterprise Architects, an open group forum where architects get together in Manila in the Philippines. So a shout out to that whole association of enterprise architects and they get together. Uh, they get together. And actually, you know, it was more by happenstance than by design that I was at the open group conference. I had planned to go visit um, an, a delivery organization that's based out of Manila. We have 6,000 people. I have two locations in Manila that are working on uh, various uh, solutions and projects. And I wanted to go meet them as it related to digital skills 
the war on talent from uh, Deloitte refers. So how do we better access delivery organizations, not in the traditional cheaper skills offshore, but how do we leverage talent that we've got offshore to work on digital transformation projects? So I turned up at this Association of Enterprise Architects, hoping to do a quick 30 minute pitch and then disappear off to talk to the delivery group. I spent two days at the open group architects conference because it was all about this issue about how do you move to an agile architecture approach in a world that is moving so quickly that the traditional approaches around enterprise architecture don't really work. Okay, so I'll cover that theme through this uh, presentation in sort of the three parts that I mentioned. So, um, can you believe it's been seven years since Mark, since Mark Andreessen wrote his seminal article in the Wall Street Journal around software is eating the universe? been seven years. And it almost feels a cliche now to talk to enterprises about being software oriented or building a software engineering, engineering function at the core of their capability. Well, it's only about um, three years now since AI has had a hype and has actually been moving in heavy in the startup world. Three years ago, four years ago, if you were to talk to most startups, they were talking about photo sharing and these kind of live streaming products, if you remember um, the sort of uh, uh, ones that were going around at the time. But now, uh, Jensen Wang from NVIDIA has recently sort of posted saying, um, well, if software was eating the universe seven years ago, AI is going to eat software. So we live in this world of significant disruption uh, driven by these key trends and investments that are going on in technical uh, disruptors. Um, uh, but we all know this, right? In the enterprises, I'm just trying to go forward here. So in the enterprises we deal with, they see this every day, right? They are being disrupted by competitors and by startups who are a lot more nimble in terms of the customer experience, exploiting new kinds of technology that are um, available. In fact, I was in the national parks in... Um, uh, Wyoming just a few weeks ago, and everywhere I went, it said, no drones, right? When did you see that kind of sign before, right? No drones allowed, and so there's a, and, and we know this from the UK, Gatwick Airport was um, disrupted significantly by um, a drone um, attack, let's call it. Um, so if the enterprise is being disrupted, it's because the consumers are very much embracing this change and driving it. And you don't need to me to tell you that. You know this, right? So here's the story of Claire and Alex. These are future people, or maybe not so future, if you think about it. So Claire is a working mom. She lives life. She shops, but she never visits a shop. She's always online, never really logs on, optimizes her digital ratings in real time, never gets lost, drives a car but hasn't quite learned to drive yet, has three jobs tailored to her family life and rarely does housework, has a robot called John. <laughs> now, um, I did on Black Friday buy a Eufy, E-U-F-Y, I'm not advertising it, I'm just telling you, um, um, vacuum cleaner, and it does the vacuuming pretty well. I mean, it docks itself, charges itself up, it's on the ground floor, it's not learned out how to walk up the stairs yet, because it's one of those that only <laughs> will move on the first floor, but this kind of stuff exists. My son is 26, he lives in London. He um, went to university in London, decided to work in London. He's a data scientist, as it happens. And he does not have a car. In fact, he hasn't learned to drive because he's betting that by 2023 or something, I think he's got a date worked out, there will be cars that will be autonomous. So why does he have to spend all this money learning to drive? I wish he would learn to drive, though, because on long journeys to Newcastle, it's um, dad who has to do the driving. Now, here's Alex. Just started work after university. Absolutely loves his job. Um, he's a maintenance engineer for a large manufacturer. He's got a smart watch that allows him to navigate to different facilities, a tablet that displays his schedule and work orders, smart glasses that provide m machine instructions. We're doing some work there with real headset, real wear headsets as well as HoloLens. HoloLens 2 coming out soon. Smart glasses that uh, display those instructions, but with videos and voice command integrated with an expert AI coach on demand if he doesn't really understand how to do something, and he operates like a seasoned pro, he's only been working for two weeks. How far off do we really think this is? Uh, I was at, in, with Microsoft in Redmond last week, and almost every single one of these scenarios was demonstrated, not as theory, but as real use cases with customers. So this technology exists. Now these Gen Z, 
yes, not millennials, <laughs> Gen Z coming into the workforce have significant expectations of uh, what work is going to be like as they move in. Trying to move forward. So we're in this third wave of uh, innovation. It's the post-cloud intelligence and automation wave. I'm not gonna go into detail in here. The main thing you should notice is there's many more things on the right than there were on the left. And even on the right, if you just pick line number four, IoT sensors, 3D printing, and serverless are probably four distinct, in fact they are, four distinct topics. We just didn't have enough room on the right hand side. The other thing is that the technologies on the left matured probably together, or if not together, were implemented in large scale programs. What's happening on the right is these technologies are maturing at different rates and are being tested at different rates and are significantly impacting existing enterprises. Um, uh, now, it's difficult to keep abreast of all of these technologies, let alone understand how to implement them. Um, more importantly, if we can go right here, here we go. Um, what we've seen is disruption um, in existing uh, technologies, including my own industry, IT services. So who would have thought Amazon would be a $20 billion cloud services provider? You know, as a bookstore, uh, would it have disrupted the HP public cloud that we originally invested in and, and HP are no longer in the public cloud business? So IT services and telecoms were the first major industries that were disrupted. Disrupted in the bottom half of this diagram actually means disintermediated or replaced by somebody else. So telco uh, was disrupted in terms of over the top providers, so we're probably all using WhatsApp or various applications today uh, rather than using SMS uh, text messages. But we also see this with Uber taxis, with Airbnb that was mentioned earlier on and so on and so forth. Uh, what's important in this um, diagram is that there's been little disruption above the line up to now in, in aerospace, defense, in healthcare, in um, accounting, in uh, law. And I'll just bring this back to my son. He was actually um, interested in becoming an actuary. So he did a, a chemical engineering degree at Imperial College. I think he should have gone and worked for Johan in Shell, <laughs> but decided he wanted to be an actuary. And after three interviews in Lloyds of London, uh, they convinced him not to become an actuary, but to become a data scientist. Because their view is, over time, actuarial work will be automated, some of that risk management. And um, so you can see now where data and AI is starting to augment the professions in the top half of this diagram. So this is where now traditional enterprises that we've worked with, um, aerospace manufacturers, defense manufacturers, engine manufacturers, et cetera, are now really interested in how technology is going to impact um, their enterprise. And all of them are looking to aspire to provide simpler, more relevant customer experiences, be leaders for innovation, and operate digital-first organizational systems. But there's some significant challenges as they try and do that. Because in a, um, I'll pick an, uh, an engine manufacturer, an aircraft, an airplane um, uh, engine manufacturer like Rolls-Royce, who's one of our customers, uh, the link through to the real customer is somewhat distant. Because the engine is put onto an airframe that is sold to a uh, that is manufactured into an aeroplane, sold to a leasing company that is used by um, an operator like uh, Singapore Airlines or British Airways. So there's some, some distance between the engine and the actual real consumer, who is Suki Gill sat on seat 20A, if I could get a window seat, <laughs> and um, consuming the service. But to bring this to life for Rolls-Royce, you have to tell the story in the eyes of the real consumer of the service, right? The real citizen or the consumer who's gonna use the service. So the story I tell typically about this is imagine that if I'm in an aircraft flying to Dublin and the pilot comes on and says, thank you for boarding on time. There is actually a fault with the engine. Um, we don't know when it's gonna be fixed, but thanks for boarding on time. 
that's a frustrated consumer, uh, citizen. But if the message was something like, um, thanks for boarding on time, there was a fault with the engine, but we diagnosed it inbound. There was a Rolls-Royce engineer waiting to fix it. It has been fixed on time. We're doing the final test. We're going to take off on time. That's a happy consumer. Now, for that experience, though, <laughs> from me, it should be invisible. Um, but for Rolls-Royce to enable that is all data-driven. Now, they do sell um, flying hours or thrust. You know, power by the hour is the sort of service architecture at Rolls-Royce. And they have um, a part of their business, which is called Rolls-Royce Data Labs, which is very much focused on data strategy, as uh, Johan talked earlier on, uh, uh, in the oil industry equivalent. And we find that that's all because they're trying to really understand how to provide this full end-to-end -end service and customer experience. Uh, but once they really understand the data in their enterprise, it also leads to business model innovation. Some of this enabled through platforms, but ultimately to monetize the data. Now, in that particular example, you really do get into arguments about who owns the data. Is the data actually owned by Rolls-Royce? Is it owned by the leasing company? Is it owned by the airframe company? Is it owned by the operator? Is it, in fact, owned by the airport who connects to that airplane to provide maintenance services when the plane actually docks for oil, uh, for pet, um, petroleum, et cetera. And um, that data becomes a really valuable asset as we move forward. So, in summary, um, we, when we talk to business customers and enterprise IT, find that in the middle circle here, a lot of the conversations are around customer experience, process transformation, and business model innovation. No longer are these conversations starting from the premise of um, uh, how do I reduce cost, but how do I provide the business agility that I need to, to my enterprise and to my C-suite to enable them to really look at how they want to drive the, the, com uh, the enterprise forward. And on the left-hand side, the three truths I've already covered, that digital consumers will drive this. They're waiting for next adoption. In fact, uh, on the open group slide, I saw a picture of a bridge. And I quickly was looking in my app, in my, on my phone for an app, that would tell me what the bridge was. Now, uh, there was a colleague sat next to me who said that's hot hippony bridge. <laughs> but you know, I was, I was a as a consumer, I wanted at hand something that would identify that bridge so I could go and have a look at it tonight. And so the consumers are really in control. They're defining the next move. They have a, a voracious appetite for a kind of capability. Platforms are what are really disrupting these value chains. And uh, uh, clearly we know, of, you know in terms of market capitalization, some of the biggest companies are platform companies uh, that exist today. But the winners in terms of enterprises will be those who exploit those platform effects. Uh, you do need to think about your own platform, but, but exploiting those existing platforms becomes key. Now, I'll come on to this piece around economic value add and return on invested capital through the next diagram, because this build is important. Now, traditionally, as DXC technology, we have mostly engaged with enterprise IT. And enterprise IT still has a habit of looking at how to reduce cost first, before they look at how to enable business. And typically that's because they're driven uh, under the CFO organization uh, f uh, in a terms of a cost to the business rather than a true enablement. But when you go talk to the business, the business is looking for these things in the middle. Business model innovation, customer experience, process transformation. Now, if you though, look at the middle circle here, digital core, and you treat that digital core as your digital platform, as the platform that you will build to enable those three things on the outer uh, edges, the business model, customer experience, and process transformation. What you'll find is that digital core will enable, and I'll come on to explain what that is, will enable those, but as, as a minimum, it will reduce the marginal cost of operating a business. Now, which CEO is not interested in reducing the cost of operating the business? In fact, when we start talking to most um, C-suite executives, 
and we look at the KPIs, there's something in there about free cash flow around cost of operating the business that is always in the top level KPIs. So this diagram talks to the, the fact that done right, modernizing your digital core, your IT, and your way of doing IT on your existing platforms today can reduce the marginal cost of your business. But if it's done right, it could also enable new value streams. And so this is the world of microservices and APIs, which says, if I can improve the cost of operating the business in a way that is driven by an enterprise architecture approach, it will also unlock the new value streams. But you can't do this in a big bang. You have to do this in a very iterative way, a continuous process of introducing, exploiting digital platforms. And the example that Johan gave earlier on around uh, the work at um, Shell around introducing that sort of data platform, uh, separating the applications from the data to enable new applications to be built to that new interface was a good example of that. So, um, just trying to move this on. Okay, in that middle uh, of that diagram, the digital core, you can't Google digital core and buy, or, or there isn't a SKU <laughs> <laughs> or, or a product that you can go buy called the digital core. But it was, it's used significantly in many um, consulting type presentations around build your digital core. So what does it mean? So in our view, this means your existing applications delivered uh, in an agile way to provide new uh, experiences. It means automate everything in the, a software defined everything way. And it means enabling the enterprise through hybrid cloud. Um, so, you know, adopting cloud as the default, um, not necessarily as an infrastructure service, but as a system of innovation, a system of uh, engagement, managing enterprise risk in a connected world, empowering workforces with invisible IT and thriving on enterprise data and analytics, all topics that were covered in the uh, Deloitte presentation. So nothing new there. But here's the piece that's missing that is probably most important. There's a different way of doing IT that is really important here. And I'll come on to that uh, as a real problem that uh, uh, is faced as enterprises move forward. Okay. Sorry. Struggling to move slide on. If you could just page on. See if you can move the slide on, please. It's flashing red here, so I don't know why it's not receiving. Can you page forward? Thank you. Um, so, don't start from the inside out, though. This is the danger as enterprise architects. We're very familiar with the existing applications, the existing infrastructure, the existing data assets. Um, while we need to understand all of these disruptions that are going around, we need to start from the outside in, from the value chain and from the KPIs the business care about. So when you go speak to somebody at Rolls-Royce that's in IT, they probably will talk to you about end of life issues on network switches in the data center. But when you go talk to somebody in the factory that is building engines, they'll talk to you about the speed of building fan blades to process the number of engines they need to build for the back order of airplanes. And so the language and the Babelfish role of enterprise architects is to talk that language on the outside of this, this circle in the middle, which is typically the process language, and which is typically the language of the business in the factory, uh, as, it ex as it relates to this example, and use that language to say, what is the problem that we can help you with? Quantify the problem in the language, and then as Babelfish, so this is the enterprise architect's uh, ability to speak both business language and then turn inwards and then speak the language inside of systems of insight, systems of engagement, the automation, the continuous delivery, and orchestrate the assets. 
Now, in traditional approach around enterprise architecture, I, ha I have to say that we, we tend to produce volumes of content before we produce anything tangible. And if you go to speak to somebody in the factory and say, I've got an idea about how to improve the number of fan blades, the first thing they're going to say is, what is that idea and can you show me something? Not can you show me a lot of documentation, a lot of diagrams, can you show me a demonstration of what you're proposing? And so as we typically engage with business customers in the language they speak about, we try and visualize, and this is my first set of recommendations, visualize the value chain and KPIs. So we, we use storyboards of that customer experience. I give you one of the Rolls-Royce uh, sort of um, engine and the customer impact. And we try to understand the velocity through that value chain. So how, how long does it take for a design from the design of an engine to move quickly through the process to impact the actual manufacture of an engine? And then what does that mean in terms of maintenance, repair, and overhaul? So the value chain from design through to engineering, through to uh, fitting onto an airframe, through to maintenance, repair, and overhaul, understand that value chain end to end and the velocity through it. Turn this business value framework that I'm describing above into a KPI dashboard and very quickly, using data and analytics, try to get to a understanding of the KPI. How many fan blades per day? What is it today and what does it need to look like? What then are the technology disruptors or the business disruptors that will enable that? Can I envision a concept or an idea that would help improve that, that I could show you quickly? And understand the stakeholder's appetite for risk and ambition. And what we're finding is, rarely do we have a business customer who says no to an idea about how you will improve their KPIs. If you get down to the operational KPIs, the business KPIs, and you can actually say things like, I'll do this risk-free, uh, sorry, I'll do this at no cost. If you don't like what I propose, then you don't need to buy anything, right? And this is mostly because my group is actually trying to truly understand, next slide, truly understand, and this is now switching to sort of the second part, try to understand what customers want to buy and what we should be building as DXE technology. So we use this framework, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Um, we use business value frameworks for every industry, 22 industries that we work in. We create these executive financial operational KPIs, we try and understand the business strategies, and we understand which accounts in DXC are mapped to these industry segments so we can work out what the business challenges are. Then we look at the industry disruption as well as the technology disruption in these innovation agenda roadmaps. We create a roadmap unconstrained to our current offerings and our current delivery capability that we have on that account to really understand what we should be focused on. And then based on client risk and appetite for of solving that problem, we propose a solution and then we rapidly build it. So this is my 2015 experience of startup brought into the enterprise to say, we need to start behaving like a lean startup within DXC technology and we need to rapidly build products. The thing is, we, we can't switch to do one-offs, right? So one of the things we've done over the last two years is we've managed to consolidate multiple portfolios into a sort of standard portfolio, and we've got a cost under control. The challenge would be if we did one of a kind for every customer that wanted something novel done, we would end up doing, a, a, the cost would go out of the room. So what we do is, across multiple sectors like aerospace and defense, we analyze where the sweet spot is for us to play, and the way we do that is using these artifacts. These are not typical enterprise architecture artifacts, but the things we do. So we use Wardley mapping. Anybody here familiar with Wardley mapping? Okay, thank you. So Simon Wardley happens to work for DXC uh, technology, sort of works for DXC technology. I think he is one of those uh, evangelists out on the uh, road talking a lot about uh, this road mapping technique, which he has donated. I mean, it's available for free to use. He just hopes people will make it better. Um, We've heard today about pioneer settlers, town planners, not, maybe not that language, but you know the concept of pioneers are good people, they do good work, 
they're different to settlers who are also good people, who work in a different domain, who are different to town planners. Now, in the uh, value chain on the left-hand side, we as DXE need to move from low value to high value, so closer to the user needs, so you can see anchoring the user needs in the top left here, and we want to be left of commodity. Commodity is low margin, competitive landscape. We want to be in the custom build to product. And why we want to be in that space is we want to move things that are custom to products that are going to be required by multiple customers of DXE. So we use this framework a lot. In fact, if somebody in my, one of my industry chief technologists, all enterprise architects, comes to me and says, I've got an idea for something we should do in manufacturing, I'll say to him, can you show me the Wardley map? How did you work this out? Now, this is, a, is an art as much as a science, and it's a, it's a way of having a conversation about where we should play. Now, once they've done that, and they convince me that we need to do something like a converged plant infrastructure for industrial IoT and a consumer IT, I would, tech, I would move then to say, well, now show me the business model canvas. So the business model canvas is a technique from Alex Osterwalder. Uh, you can look for a strategizer template. I think there's many. This was the frog design diagram that I didn't find in this format in the startup, but was in the, in, in the wiki that I ultimately did discover. What did I discover? I found the value proposition. I found what customer segment we were trying to go to. And I found roughly what cost and profit we were trying to build in that product. But the most important part of this initially is list the value proposition to the customer segment. What are you proposing to that particular customer? Now, we run Dragon's Dens now. Within Dragon's Den is like Shark Tank, for, is the US equivalent, so Dragon's Den. So once a month, I run a circle of, um, I, I invite people from academia, from partners, and from other parts of the business, and we sit, five or six of us, we don't really have money in hand, but we ask our chief technologist to come in and pitch their business model canvases. And they say to us, look, Suki, I think we really should build this because there are seven customers. If we built this once, there are seven other customers who would be really interested in taking this as a service. So we use this internally a lot, and I am now actually betting money on particular scenarios, this one included, um, for uh, real products to go to market. Now, the interesting thing is, this sort of exists in DXC, but it doesn't exist as a go-to-market proposition. It exists as a whole bunch of reference architectures. So we do have like a CRM block. I'm looking at the bottom part of this diagram. We have CRM blocks, we have technology platform blocks, we have scheduling and forecasting blocks, you know, the traveling salesman algorithm applies. We have omni-location blocks, we have smart technician blocks. They're not being aggregated into a field workforce compound. At the same time, I also have these data exploitation blocks like data acquisition analysis and so on. Imagine, though, the enterprise architects could pull this together and give this to a scrum team which says, here are the assets in the organization that already exist that need to be pulled together to, to be delivered. And so this is where we're having some real success in using enterprise architects. Outside in looking at the real business problem, what needs to be solved, looking across the industry and narrowing in on a focus, and then looking internally and saying, it's okay, this stuff exists. It just happens to be in a project that we delivered in the Middle East, or it happens to be in this hospital solution over here, and what we need to do is refactor the components and reorchestrate them into new value propositions. So that's a lot of the work going on inside DXE. So use mapping techniques to determine where to place bets. Worldly Maps is one example, there are many others. Uh, validate ideas using a business model canvas. We're finding real success with this. It's easy to fill in. And then lastly, use a solution canvas to provide architecture context. Um, it, otherwise, you will get lots of technical debt. You will have dev teams who will go build stuff that already exists. Uh, last piece, the biggest problem, though, with all of this is the culture shift that needs to take place. Um, uh, this is work from Leading Edge Forum within DXC called the 21st Century Enterprise, and it talks about multiple dimensions of change for new organizational thinking and culture. Deloitte covered this uh, briefly. What we find is that understanding how we're going to work differently on the left-hand side, 
three dimensions, how we're going to design differently, how we're going to use platforms in the middle differently, and how we're going to rapidly build things, experiment, fail, fast, trial things out, becomes a new set of capabilities that we need in our delivery centers worldwide, and also onshore close to the client. So we're having to shift from this take orders for things we can deliver offshore to be much closer to the client to understand the problem we need to solve and how we can design that experience or that process transformation and then leverage skills offshore to, to do this. Uh, in the middle part, cloud analytics, mobility, and security are just like the, the basics. If you can't navigate those, you will be lost. Those are the table stakes. Uh, but, but having partners who really understand some of the other dimensions. So actually within DXC, we've got a set of labs that do the things uh, above, but we also rely heavily on partners, which is why I was in Redmond next week. And then on the right-hand side, if you thought you had a lot of partners to navigate as architects or uh, IT uh, enterprise, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to end up working with a lot more smaller niche players and startups and ISVs to navigate the landscape. So I'll move, oh, by the way, don't just try and copy, and I'm gonna say it, you're going to curse me afterwards, scaled agile framework or the Spotify model or somebody else's. That's merely cargo culting somebody else's tech, uh, um, culture. Take those as inputs and apply them to yourself. And I would say that when, when I get asked this question, I always go back to the agile manifesto and say, start here. Clearly, Spotify, in terms of tribes, guilds, and so on, might be useful to you, or the scaled agile framework, which is also called the revenge of the PMO, by the way, if you want to Google that, right? <laughs> um, so those may be applicable, but you have to apply them in the context of your particular enterprise. So my last recommendations in this space are, it's a major culture shift, this way of working, this speed. Uh, this is a quote from somebody at Netflix. So guardrails, not gates, context, not control, openly transparent about everything, loosely coupled about highly aligned, but these can only work if they complement your culture. The design and architecture of your systems effectively mirrors the design and architecture of your organization. And Deloitte covered that earlier on. Develop and invest in digital skills, capabilities, technologies. Think big, execute small, fail early, turn ideas into fast prototypes and iterate. This is the hardest thing that I found to try and shift within an enterprise. They just don't like to fail at all at anything, and they don't know how to do things at speed and at small scale fast. So that's my talk today, and I know I'm over time. So you know, if you do do this in a structured way, um, you will find that not only can you reduce the cost of operating the business, so that digital core will help provide that business agility and value, but it will also enable these higher level things that the business cares about, process efficiency, better customer experiences and business model innovation. Okay, thank you. So you talked of um, staying left of commodities. In other words, finding some products that multiple customers in an industry might, might uh, utilize. Um, how do you see the role of leveraging standards to help achieve that? So I, I thought the example from Johan was excellent, right? So the innovation isn't at the data lake level or at the you know, aggregated data level. It's actually how you use that above the line. Mm -hmm. So I actually think where you need communities coming together in a consistent approach around data standards, as an example, or even, uh, although I dissed it a little bit, scaled agile framework, those standards actually are relevant and applicable in helping people l learn from learn lessons, right? Learn from mm -hmm. other people's, uh, if people moving ahead of them and laying those out as repeatable ways of working. Nice. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, how would an agile approach for applications and digital experience be delivered in cases where organizations have legacy system and assets in their digital core? Uh, very good. So, and I'm gonna pick an example here. So when I was talking to somebody in Rolls-Royce IT and they specifically said, but Suki, you don't understand. 
I'm not getting enough money for modernizing the network switches in the data center. I said, but when the cash flow problem is the thing that matters to the CEO, you need to combine this end of life problem with a problem that matters to the business, which is building more engines, building more fan blades. So one of the things we find is that the IT is somewhat disconnected to the real challenges the business is facing over here. And the role of an enterprise architect can join the two together. What an enterprise architect can say is, look, to deliver the outcome, which is more fan blades, faster build of engines, here are the systems that need to be improved, processes to some extent, the more traditional enterprise architecture. And this then is the portfolio of projects that are required. And there is some risk in the network level that will impact the build out of the switches. That needs to be pulled together as part of the overall program. Trying to disconnect the data center and the network from the real challenge the business is facing is what leads to these disconnected requests for money. Great answer, thank you. Um, you cited examples in manufacturing. Uh, have you worked with customers all the way to the shop floor? And is OT different to IT? Yeah, so I can't name the customer, but uh, we are currently working on a smart factory project for a customer. And the target there was the factory manager. So we engage with a factory manager. One of the challenges the factory had was on something called OEE. It's a KPI, a metric, which is operational equipment effectiveness. So the uptime of the machines in the factory impacts the build of product through the factory. And um, what we found was the operational equipment effectiveness of a particular factory was way below the standard that would allow that factory to bid for future work. There's a, now a standard emerging which says this is the kind of productivity we expect in plants to deliver this kind of capability. So we looked at that threat and risk that that factory had, and we proposed that by instrumenting some of the factories in the operational technology domain and getting access to that data in the IT domain, we could improve the uptime of the machines. And so that project was sold not to IT, but sold to the business, but we had to engage with IT because of the security of the data coming from the OT side to the IT side. And so this is where I think engaging with the business, working out specific projects, and by the way, that has turned into a portfolio engagement for us because we're having now this conversation in multiple factories. And I'm, I'm picking manufacturing just as a theme here, but that isn't the only industry we work with. Right. But, then, but that particular case, that's a challenge. There's many experiments in IoT and in operational technology space, but not many have actually resulted in the true business benefit that is, is, needs to be realized. Yeah. Tiki, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much.